Uh, all right, good morning, everybody. It's um, my pleasure to introduce this morning's Grand Round speaker. Dr. Ned Sharpless is an old friend and colleague from Chapel Hill and UNC days. Ned's uh, originally from Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, a proud graduate of Greensboro Day. I think we wrestled Greensboro Day when I was in high school uh, in Ashboro. But Ned's a, a fantastic researcher, a world-renowned scientist, and a great clinician, which probably goes underappreciated uh, from working with him on the wards back in Chapel Hill. Um, Ned is uh, the Cancer Center Director at the University of North Carolina at Lineberger uh, Conference of Cancer Center. He's got an extensive track record uh, in looking at cell cycle uh, and aging genes uh, as well, and so cell cycle growth regulation of cancer uh, as it pertains to a variety of solid and hematologic malignancies and also aging. And so he's had a very long and experienced track record looking through that, that work. Um, again, he's a Cancer Center Director at UNC, but is also founder of G0 Therapeutics, a company that's looking at molecules that uh, inhibit cell cycle movement at various points along the, the pathway. Uh, so without further, uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Ned and say thanks and for coming and welcome to Atlanta. Thank you. Oh, it's great to be back. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, I, um, I uh, you know, always love coming somewhere where the weather's as good as North Carolina. You know, usually you're going to speak to, you know, like Boston or something and it's freezing. So it's nice to come down in 70 degree days. So yeah, I'm going to talk. I have some disclosures to show that just out of an abundance of caution. I, I, most of them I don't think are relevant to today's talk, but uh, but uh, ooh, what did I do there? But um, no, that's the laser pointer. But one is so, so I'm going to talk. Actually, Don, and then he's old school. Yeah. So every time the the, the venture capitalists in, invested, they wanted to increase the number one. So we you know, you know it's going to be S phase next, I think, as we're going through the cell cycle. But. Uh, in any event, uh, that's probably, I'm going to talk about this, uh, this uh, endeavor to sort of develop CDK4 inhibitors for clinical use. So, um, God, that button's in the wrong place. So, uh, my lab studies sort of um, a pretty simple biochemical system that's been uh, known about for a long time. There are two kinases called cyclin-dependent kinase 4 and cyclin-dependent kinase 6, CDK4 and 6. And they are, uh, in my sort of high-tech uh, animation here, activated by the D-type cyclins, which there are three of those. So, two kinases, three activators. And, uh, and that, that interaction uh, tells a cell to divide. And importantly, it's not every cell needs this interaction to divide. Some cells can divide independent of these kinases, but, um, but certainly some cells are, are, are taught to divide by the activation of four and six, which phosphorylate the RB family of proteins to activate proliferation. And then there's some inhibitors of uh, CDK4-6, and these are the INC class inhibitors, so inhibitor of CDK4 is the, the, where the nomenclature comes from. And the most famous molecule in that field is, is P16 or the CDK into a tumor suppressor locus. And P16 is after P53, the most commonly deleted or mutated gene in human cancer. And this is an important uh, inhibitor of proliferation. And if this uh, interaction occurs, then uh, the, the CDK4 changes shape and, and the D-type cyclins can't bind. And so this leads to no proliferation. So the simple decision of divide or not divide, I would argue, is uh, you know certainly very relevant to cancer, but it's also a tremendous biologic importance to a number of uh, systems. And, uh, and that's sort of what my lab has always worked on, is, is um, you know, I, when I try and describe the thesis of my lab, we, we've sort of focused on the interaction and implications of this model. And so, you know, usually, as, as Don alluded to, I, I talk about this topic, which is a, a Baroque long story that has a lot of twists and turns to it, and I think is, uh, is actually really interesting right now. So there's, for those of you who haven't followed the senescence and senolytic field, uh, you know, Google this. It's really happening. So after 20 years of sort of nothing therapeutically interesting going on in aging research, uh, times have changed. But, you know, because of, this is a predominantly cancer audience, I thought today I'd talk more about this, which is an interesting topic as well that I think is emerging, which is the sort of use of uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors for therapeutic purposes in cancer patients in a variety of different ways. So, um, and the, the important thing to know about this and is, uh, is the uh, history of the field a little bit is is uh, this was sort of late to come. If you, if you think about it, you know, the kinase that causes cells to divide is the most obvious kinase to target for cancer therapy, right? So you ask, why, why, did, why are CDK4 inhibitors so much later than RAF inhibitors and other things? And the answer is that this was sort of the model pharma companies were working on in about 2002, that uh, the, the notion was that four and six phosphorylated RB and then that activated CDK2 by uh, activating the E-type cyclins and that really phosphorylated RB, and that's what made the cells divide. So in this model, the important kinase really is CDK2. And we used to always talk a lot at cell cycle meetings about 
this, this hill, this mythical hill that had a boulder at the top of it. And the, the boulder was given a push by four six, and then it would kept rolling down the hill by two. And so the, the, many pharma companies decided they didn't want a drug the cell cycle at all because they thought, you know, this linear system happened in every dividing cell and inhibiting four, six, or two would be very toxic. It would cause myelosuppression and gut toxicity. And the few companies that did try and work on it, for the most part, focused on CDK2 because they thought that was the important target. And so 4-6 was somewhat ignored. There was also, there were also chemistry, medicinal chemistry reasons why I think it was thought to be an intractable target, but that turned out to be wrong. And, and this model uh, makes a bunch of predictions, um, and pretty much all of them were tested, in, and it's derived from sort of yeast and flies, and, uh, and, and, uh, and pretty much as, as these predictions were tested in murine models, they all turned out to be false. And so, uh, you know, I, I could show 40 papers on that sort of disprove that model, but the one I sort of like uh, is a, an experiment that Peter Szynski did where he made mice that didn't have any of the D-type cyclins, so not D1, not D2, D3, totally unable to activate CDK4 and CDK6. And, you know, I remember when Peter told me he was doing this experiment, I, I, I thought that was like the stupidest experiment imaginable because some poor graduate student or postdoc was going to have to cross these three alleles and it would be a 1 in 128 mice with other genes. And then the, the, all the cells would die, the embryos would die at like the two cell stage. We all knew that's what was going to happen because, you know, CDK4 and 6 were required for every proliferative event at the time is what we thought. And in fact, that's not at all what happened. It was a great experiment. It was really a field-changing experiment. It showed that, that you could get uh, pretty much a, almost an intact mouse. The uh, embryos would make it to about day 16. You know, embryogenesis in a mouse is day 21 days. So uh, the, the, a lot of proliferation would occur. You'd have many, many proliferative events in the absence of CDK4-6 activity. And eventually the animals died because they couldn't make blood. So uh, you know, the, the hematopoietic progenitors, the, the fetal hematopoietic progenitors were compromised, and, and so they, they died of sort of anemia if you will, but pretty uh, late, right? A lot of proliferation can occur in the absence of 4-6. Uh, Mariana Barbacid did the, the converse experiment by knocking out CDK4 and CDK6 and got the exact same phenotype. And then the, the real sort of nail in the coffin for the model I showed was that uh, when others knocked out CDK2, uh, you remember that was the main kinase, that was the important one, right? That, that every cell needed to divide and those animals are totally normal. So they had no phenotype. And they're running around the cage and uh, indistinguishable for the most part from their litter mates. So, so that turned out to be wrong, right? The, the cell cycle model that we uh, had all worked, labored under for many years was, you know, radically incorrect. And the, the right model is a lot more complicated. And it looks something like this. Although this is even kind of a simplification. But the idea is in some cells, 4, 6 can phosphorylate RB or 2 can. And uh, either one works. And in some cells, only four or only six will work. And in some cells, probably only two will work. And, and th there's this sort of uh, not parallel, you know, I mean, not series behavior of the kinase, but this parallel behavior in many cells. And, and the reason this is important is because, for, you know, once, like, while I was sitting in Peter's talk and explaining this, it occurred to me that all of a sudden that this meant that CDK4-6 was actually a pretty good drug target because there were clearly some cancers that seemed to depend on this kinase, but most proliferative events didn't. And so right about this time, we worked very hard to acquire a good CDK4-6 inhibitor. And at that time, you know, we didn't know much about MedChem ourselves, so we asked all the various pharma companies that we thought might have one, and we were eventually pointed to Pfizer by uh, actually colleagues at GSK who said, don't use our kinase inhibitor, Pfizer's is better. And uh, we obtained this compound that at that time was called something 991, but eventually became known as palpocyclib. And we, uh, Pfizer gave it to us to see if it would work in melanoma models. So my lab has always had an interest in murine models of melanoma. And uh, they wanted to, you know, since melanoma is driven by uh, loss of P16, the inhibitor of CDK4, they thought it would be a good idea to test palpocyclib in melanoma models, which we tried, and it had stunningly no activity. I mean, like nothing. I mean, it was completely superimposable growth curves. And the, the result was so striking that we thought maybe the mice weren't absorbing the drug or, you know, it wasn't being, it wasn't hitting the murine target because it was developed in the human kinase or something like that. So we did, uh, you know, what you do in that situation, which is a pharmacodynamic experiment. And we thought what, ce what cells, if any, should be sensitive to a 4-6 inhibitor uh, and see if we alter the proliferation of those. And so we showed uh, quite strikingly that uh, beta cells in the pancreatic islet, you know, this is, so brown here is, um, is a marker of proliferation. I think this is, uh, I think this is uh, uh, EDU. But uh, 
uh, so about 1% of beta cells divide in a young animal, and that's completely stopped by uh, treating with a CDK4 inhibitor. And similarly, there's some cells in the intermediate lobe of the pituitary, which is a structure mice have that humans don't, that also don't divide when uh, inhibited with a CDK4 inhibitor. And uh, pretty much all lymphocytes, so B cells and T cells, are quite sensitive to CDK4 inhibitors and stop dividing. But for the most part, all the other dividing cells of a mouse are fine. So the gut divides pretty much the same. The, the vast majority of cells in the bone marrow divide about the same, although we'll talk about, the, you know, certainly not the early progenitors. And so that was very striking to us. We realized we could use, you know, sort of palbociclib to, first of all, it worked. It hit the murine kinase. They absorbed the drug. And we could use it to sort of map what structures in the adult animal were dependent, required 4-6 for proliferations, and which one didn't. And the, the result was most proliferating cells divide just fine when uh, a mammal takes a CDK4-6 inhibitor, which is, many of you know, palbociclib is a pretty well-tolerated drug. It's not very toxic, uh, consistent with that, that notion in humans. So, um, you know, this meant, as I alluded to, that you can modulate the proliferation of some cells but not others with minimal toxicity, and that's uh, good for cancer, right? That was the whole anti-neoplastic concept, and that's what Pfizer was trying to do with their compound. But it also meant something else, we thought, which is you could block, block the proliferation of, of a would-be therapeutic. Um, uh, you know, you could decrease the number of an unwanted cell, like a breast cancer cell, but you could also protect a wanted cell. And the reason you could protect it is because, you know, it's been known since the 1960s that a lot of kinds of cell cycle insults are toxic in a cell cycle dependent way. So DNA damaging agents like platinum and radiation kill in a manner that depends on the cell cycle. And if one can entrain cells out of the cell cycle, one has the opportunity to then make DNA damaging agents either more or less toxic depending on, on how you modulate the cell cycle relevant to the exposure. So we uh, thought we kind of wanted to work on both ideas. Um, so, you know, the unwanted cells that you might want to block with a 4 or 6 inhibitor, I think neoplasms is the most obvious idea. Uh, but I do believe there's actually a, a case for these drugs in autoimmune disease. They're very potent modulators of lymphocyte proliferation, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, it turns out a recent appreciation, mostly coming out of GWAS, is that uh, there's a sort of monocyte-derived cell that lives in atherosclerotic plaques that's regulated by P16 and is a, a very important determinant of human atherosclerosis risk. And this is completely inhibited, it turns out, by CDK4 inhibitors. Uh, and then vascular progenitors possibly as well. But then there's also some wanted cells you might want to protect. And the one that occurred to us immediately was hematopoietic progenitors. I already showed Peter Szynski's role that cyclin B is required for hematopoietic stem cell proliferation. And it turns out it's true for other early progenitors as well. And then with working with Ben Humphreys uh, from the, at that time, Harvard University, we later showed that the renal epithelia also is a CDK4-dependent tissue that might be protected. Uh, and so that's really sort of more what I'm going to focus on today. And, and one thing we appreciated at that time was that, there, you know, if you wanted to do all these different things, and you know how pharmaceutical companies work in this concept of indication splitting, that they don't really want to try multiple different projects with the same molecule, then you realize very quickly there weren't enough good CDK4 inhibitors in the world. And so we spent a lot of time trying to acquire our own CDK4 inhibitor, and when that failed, we just made our own. And I'll talk about a little bit about the medicinal chemistry effort that lead, led to the const compounds that are now in clinical trials. So we uh, started a med chem effort with a guy named Francis Tavares, a, a chemist who'd been out of GSK, who'd worked on CDK2 uh, in a project at GSK. And we did, ended up making about 150 molecules. And I'll show the structure of the, of the scaffold that we worked on. But I, I think importantly, the, the scaffold that we identified um, is a little more rigid than the other CDK4 inhibitors in our clinical trials, and uh, it's rigid in a good way, such that uh, almost all the members of the, of, the, of the series are highly potent. So the first molecule we made was more potent than South Palbociclib and more selective, and pretty much there are like 30 or 40 molecules in that series that are sort of subnanimal or inhibitors of CDK4. And so these are uh, uh, two of the molecules I'll talk about today. Um, this is uh, the drug that's now been renamed as Trilocyclib, and it's an 800 picomolar inhibitor for and a you know, 6 nanomolar inhibitor CDK6. And really importantly, uh, it's a very selective compound against CDK2. And when we started this prog pro program, we didn't know if inhibiting CDK2 would be a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, you could kind of argue it both ways, and, but we realized very quickly that inhibiting CDK2 is bad. That the compounds that do that have much more toxicity and don't do some of the things that we wanted to do. Uh, 38 one, so the trilocyclib is a, is a great CDK4 inhibitor. It has good pharmacology. It has uh, a lot of properties that are desirable, except it has one bad thing, which it's completely not orally bioavailable. So using this as an oral antineoplastic is a non-starter. 
But that's okay because we wanted, for the chemoprotection thing, we wanted to do an IV formulation anyway. But this molecule, 38, is orally available, and this is the compound that's going forward as an antimeoplastic. And for comparison, this is palbociclib here, you know, as it's, with its old name. So uh, as I said, trilocyclib is a potent selective. Uh, it provides an optimal G1 arrest. It doesn't kill cells. It doesn't do things that CDK4 inhibitors shouldn't do. And as I mentioned, an IV formulation. So uh, first I'll talk a little bit about 4-6 inhibitors for um, anti-neoplastic purposes, which is probably, you know, what the, this, you guys are probably most familiar with. It's, it's certainly been an exciting area over the last few years. And the, the rationale for this, I think, is pretty straightforward. As I mentioned earlier, CDK and 2A, the, the inhibitor of CDK4 and CDK6, is uh, the most common site of cytogenic deletion in human malignancies. And then uh, not only is P16 loss super common, but then there are lots of cancers that have cyclin D amplification and translocations. And that even now more recently, CDK4 and CDK6 amplifications are being discovered in several cancers, squamous malignancies in particular. And, uh, and then, as I mentioned, you can therapeutically target it without that much toxicity to the host. So, it, it, you know, the, off I mean, the on-target toxicity of a 4-6 inhibitor is tolerable for the most part. And then, uh, and then I, I think, you know, back in the, we probably don't need to say this today, but when I started in this field, you know, five years ago, and I would try and tell phase one people about CDK4 inhibitors, they'd always say, oh, we did CDK inhibitors. This, you know, we did flavopyridol. Those were terrible drugs. They were, you know, really nasty and caused awful diarrhea and stuff. And, and these, you know, drugs like palbociclib and ribociclib should not be confused with CDK inhibitors, which is a whole different kettle of fish. And, and now CDK7 and CDK9 inhibitors are very different molecules, very different toxicity. Uh, so 4 6 inhibitors are pretty well tolerated for the most part. So here's uh, a, a mouse model data uh, using some of the G1 compounds. I could show very similar data with palbociclib. Basically, this is a model, uh, a HER2-driven breast model. Uh, in MTV, new, we saw autothenous tumors in mice. These are not xenografts. And basically, when the animals are fed the drug, their tumors stop growing. And when you stop the drug, they start growing again. This has always been the result for us. We don't think these molecules cause cancer cells to die. We don't think these molecules cause cancer cells to enter senescence, this vague concept that's being advanced by some of the pharma companies. We think these molecules are, for the most part, cytostatic. They're very effective, but when you withdraw them, tumors always come back, and uh, in our experience. Um, but, you know, in these models, they're super potent. I mean, they're among the most, uh, you know, we've tested hundreds of molecules in the mouse phase at the University of North Carolina, and this is among some of the best results we've seen. I mean, it, it's really complete remission that is durable as long as the animals are in therapy. It's very hard to get resistance to these agents in, these, in, this, in this model, for example. So uh, the progress in this area, I think, has been rather striking. Um, you know, and, and but it's important to say, you know, palbociclib languished for a very long time. It really uh, was at Pfizer, you know, it's a Park, PD stands for Park Davis. So it was Park Davis and then, you know, some, they bought, got bought by somebody and then they got bought by somebody and ended up as a Pfizer molecule. And, and so it was really, uh, it, the clinical development of it was not straightforward. And I can, I know from, you know, dealing with the Pfizer scientists that they almost gave up on it several times because it really wasn't obvious how it would work. And the, the problem with CDK4 inhibitors for their clinical development is they don't have a lot of single agent activity. So you do a phase one trial with a CDK4 inhibitor, nothing happens, and you think it's a dead molecule. And it really was until the uh, combination with anti-estrogens in breast cancer that, you know, these became exciting. But once that, uh, was, that combination was identified by Dennis Slayman and others, it really uh, took off. So palbociclib was approved uh, almost exactly two years ago for ER-positive breast cancer. Single agent activity is pretty underwhelming of all these molecules. A, a, a bimacyclib, the lily molecule, has some single agent activity, whereas I think the others all do not. Um, Ribocyclib is the Novartis molecule and is, uh, I think, probably going to get approved soon. And then Lilly has a somewhat different uh, chemotype that they work from. So the ribocyclib and the Pfizer drugs and the G1 drugs all come from a more kind of ATP-looking backbone. And the Lilly is a store sporin derivative and is a very potent inhibitor, but it's also a, a, a good bit dirtier, I think, than the other molecules and has significant activity against CDK2. Uh, so here's palbociclib, and, and, and we talk about, you know, these molecules is basically you got sort of New England and Florida and Oregon, and, uh, you know, th th this, this is the, uh, the patentable piece. You know, all, I, I, I won't go through and show a lot of these, but ribocyclib, palbociclib, and the G1 molecules all kind of have something that looks like this. That seems to be the optimal structure for, um, for pharmacologic properties. And the differences in the molecules are all kind of down here, and, and when I show the G1 molecules, uh, you'll notice that they have closed this third ring here, and so they're tricyclic molecules, and that's why it's trilocyclib. Right? When the company first told me that was the name, I thought that was for trilineage hematopoiesis, and I got very mad 
because we protect quadrilineal hematopoiesis. And I was like, it's quadricyclic. And they were like, no, no, try is the ring. So not the, uh, not, but, 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 it, but I think that, that I alluded to this Gibbs free energy thing about, uh, you know, having a confirmation that seems to be very good fit for the CDK4 lock. And, and that is, uh, we think, why, you know, because of that structure, there, there's some lack of uh, flexibility of the molecule that means it's, it, they're, they're very good for six centimeters. But it's a palpocyclib. Um, this is sort of the Paloma trial that got it approved. Uh, you know, doubles PFS in uh, ER positive breast cancer in combination with letrozole in this study. Uh, even better looking data when combined with full strength. So uh, real, um, you know, the, the, for maybe few of you in here aren't uh, sort of phase one people, you know, the old joke in oncology is if you get the laser pointer between the curves, it's a positive trial in the lung cancer world. And uh, this is clearly a pretty good, you know, a, you know doubling of PFS in a, in a common cancer just doesn't happen very often much in medical oncology anymore. Uh, you know, if you don't believe that's important, you know, you can show the, uh, the price of Pfizer stock, which is, uh, you know, went up 10% right after the approval, which is a $200 billion company. So that's $20 billion of market cap created by this drug alone. And so far, it seems to be validated. You know, palpocyclib did a billion dollars its first year. 80% of medical oncologists say they've given palpocyclib already within two years of approval. That's a remarkable uptake. I promise you 50% of oncologists haven't given enrollment. Right, so we talk a lot about immuno checkpoint inhibitors, but this is the biggest blockbuster approved recently. And I think also this is likely to become the most valuable kinase inhibitor in, in medicine. Uh, so that's uh, why uh, ribocyclob and abimbocyclob are so close behind and nipping at their heels. Uh, here's a slide sort of summarizing them. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, the, all the uh, antineoplastic compounds want to be given orally. They're all, you know, sort of 10 nanomolar against CDK4 or lower. Uh, they, all, they all have longer half-lives. The bimocyclib may have a little bit shorter half-life, and that, that may be why they can give theirs continuously, where the other two have to be given with a one-week break. So it's three weeks on, one week off. And the reason you have to take a week off is because they all cause really bad granulocytopenia. So in the Paloma trial, like 50% of the patients had, an, uh, had a dose reduction or a dose, uh, dose extension for neutropenia. Uh, but it, it, importantly, I think, while granulocytopenia is super common with these drugs, febrile neutropenia is not. Because if you think about it, these drugs don't damage the gut, they don't translate bacteria, they don't do the things that like platinum does. So, you know, patients who can seem to tolerate these periods of neutropenia pretty well. Uh, they also cause some other bone marrow toxicity uh, and then some fatigue. Uh, the ribocyclob, the New England Journal paper that was recently published uh, was, you know, covered the New York Times, uh, lead article in the New England Journal. It was uh, hailed as a heroically positive study. But I, I think if you look at that trial, you'll see they had a lot of uh, QT prolongation and uh, two deaths from arrhythmia, and then a uh, 3% incidence of liver injury, which palpocyclib doesn't seem to have. So I really wonder about the viability of this compound compared to palpocyclib. If, you know, it's just palpocyclib but more toxic and less active, it doesn't seem like it has much of a future to me. Uh, so, I, I, but the problem is, you know, in a rational world, I think this would win. But the, the really, the, what's driving a lot of this is commercial considerations, because none of these agents are active as single agents. So the question isn't, is palbo better than ribo? The question is, what plus palbo is better or less good than what plus ribo? So is, you know, if ribo is with full strength, that could be better than palbo plus letrozole. So there, so there are these commercial reasons that make this a very challenging space to figure out what's going to happen. Abimocyclob, as I said, is uh, somewhat different. It is a bit more toxic. It's given daily. It has a lot more diarrhea and GI toxicity. We believe that's because it inhibits CDK2. Uh, uh, and, but it has less neutropenia, probably because the doses aren't quite as high in terms of inhibiting CDK4. All of them are in ER positive breast cancer as initial indications, but all of them are being studied in many cancers now, and it's hard to think of a malignancy where there's not a CDK4 inhibitor trial going on in some nature. And I would just point out the newest one is it's just the human clinical trial started in the last few months is, is the G1 compound. We really don't know its toxicity in people yet. It's too new. It's been in normal human volunteers, but it hasn't really been in, a, in cancer patients. This is the trial. I, I should mention it's filling incredibly fast because it's only open in Europe where fulvastrant is not easy to get. So AstraZeneca contributed uh, fulvastrant for this trial, so it's the G1 drug plus fulvastrant. And as you can imagine, oncologists are eager to give that to their patients. So it's, uh, I, I don't know if they're ever get you open in the United States because I think it's gonna, probably going to fill before. The plan had been to open in the U.S., but I don't think it's going to happen based on the fill rate. Um, so that's uh, the inhibitors as um, antineoplastics, and I can tell you, you know, there will be many posters, abstracts, and presentations at ASCO and AACR this year about these molecules in non-breast cancer malignancies. So they're using RAS mutant breast cancer, I mean, lung cancer. They're using certain subtypes of bladder cancer. 
Their use in, uh, in sarcoma has been very exciting. Uh, there's some interest in glioma with the bimcyclib. So I think we'll be hearing a lot about it. Uh, what I would say for my, you know, sort of interest in the field to date is that the real disappointing part about it to me has been there's been no ability to identify biomarker. So we really can't predict who's going to respond to these compounds and who isn't other than they have to have intact RB. So the one thing that we all agree is an important biomarker is the tumor has to be RB competent. If it's an RB deleted cancer, these drugs never work. But other than that, you know, CDK4 amplification or CDK cyclin D amplification or P16 loss, none of those things have really been predictive in breast cancer or other malignancies to date. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, is, is the use of good old cytotoxic chemotherapy. And I have to make a digression here. So I was, when I was a young scientist, Jim Watson came and spoke at the University of North Carolina, and he gave these three rules for young scientists. And rule number one was never work on anything boring. And, uh, and I, I took that to, to, to heart, and, 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 and what I'm going to talk about next would seem to violate that rule. And so I want to point, point out that this is actually not a boring topic. This is a, a, a several, uh, actually two years ago, we gave a, a Banbury conference on the, at the at Culture Marine Harbor on the 20th anniversary of the discovery of the CDK and 2A locus by uh, David Beach and others. And, and Jim Watson came to every single talk of our, of our, our talk, and, and so I, I got a selfie with him. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so never work on anything boring. He gave, the two other rules he gave were, I don't remember because they were boring, but the, 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 the exciting one was this one. And, 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 and I'm going to argue that, that cytotoxic chemotherapy and the molecules that were invented in the 60s and 70s are, are actually exciting. And uh, the reason uh, I feel that is, is you know, because as I said, we've literally given thousands of compounds to pretty good genetically engineered models where we don't have any dog in the fight. We don't want this one to work better than that one. We just want to find out what works best. And, you know, the dirty secret if you do that, and also it's true in xenograft models as well for the most part, is that if you take these, you know, these exciting, so these are the sort of interesting drugs. Oops, got to go back. The interesting drugs are, are these different kinase inhibitors that were given to us by pharma companies, and they're all, you know, a little better than, plus, than, than untreated animals, but none of them are nearly as good as cytoxan, right? So, you know, whenever the pharma company will throw in, you know, vincristin or cytoxan or adriamycin into these xenograft or, or, or uh, you know, genetically engineered models are often much more active than the stuff that we think is like really hot and cool. And uh, similarly, if you, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, vimurafenib, this is the trial that, you know, sort of got it approved. If you look at the line here, that's like four months of, of PFS. You know, that's not, if you have metastatic melanoma, this is no home run, right? And, and if you think about it, there were like 10 articles on, in Science Nature Cell, on resistance to vimurafenib and how it, how it occurs in patients. And none of them, the clinical impact of that is pretty modest. I mean, we've learned to give vimurafenib with MEK inhibitors in melanoma. But it's like a 0% cure rate, and as a single agent, it doesn't do much. But, you know, you try and find out the importance of adriamycin in lymphoma, you can't even find such data because it wouldn't be ethical to do the trial. You know, I can show you this. We all know that CVP, you know, the three drugs of CHOP without adriamycin cures no one, and CHOP cures, you know, 40 50% of patients. So adriamycin, I think you have to conclude, is a super active molecule, at least in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it is, you know, curative in a substantial, you know, if we had a drug that cured 40% of any common cancer today, we'd all be doing backflips. So I think that these, these molecules, the reason, I often, I, I get when like young oncologists say, you know, my goal in life is to never give chemotherapy again. I just want to replace it with kinase inhibitors and immunotherapy. And I just, I always laugh when they say that because I, I plan to be writing, you know, Donna Rubis in my last day before I retire because I'm sure these things are not going away because they're so active. And if you ask oncologists in the community what drugs they give the most of, it's platinum, taxol, adriamycin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, that's why I think this, this topic's important because we're going to need to use these molecules and so we need to make them work better and we need to understand. You no, know, what we really haven't done is figure out, you know, why 10% of melanoma patients respond to temozolomide. That would be an interesting question. We, we don't really under, understand biomarkers of response. I think they turn out to be complicated. But um, that would be, I think, a useful thing to do, but there's no sort of commercial push to figure that out for a molecule that's off patent. But, you know, so DNA damaging effects, uh, we do know something about how they work. And as I said, one of the things that's very important is where in this cell cycle the, the cell is when it gets damaged. And so this literally is work that's, you know, over 50 years old now. But the idea is if the damage occurs uh, right before the cell enters S phase or, or it occurs at the end of sort of G2, it's very, very toxic to a cell. But if a cell is damaged early in G1 or late in S, it's, it's pretty well tolerated. And a, a follow-up paper to this in like 1965 showed that if you damage cells in G1 and then lengthen the period of G1 by serum starvation at that time, by maneuvers to prevent the cells from dividing, similarly, 
the, uh, the, the toxicity of DNA damaging agents is, is much lower. And I think this is you know, known to us, this is that, that uh, if, we, if cells aren't cycling, our ability to kill them with radiation and platinum is lower. So, uh, and this was the experiment that sort of got us started in the field. So, as I mentioned, I got like a gram of palbociclib from Pfizer to try and cure melanoma with it. And we knew after about 50 milligrams of experiment that it wasn't going to work because it was totally inert in that model. And so I had all this palbociclib left over. And I called Pfizer up and I asked them if, you know, we have this idea about protecting the bone marrow. Can I use it for that? And they were like, sure, whatever, who cares? You know, <laughs> we got kilograms of the stuff. Don't, don't send it back. So... You know, I have to say that the scientists at Pfizer, you know, you know, when things got commercial, it changed. But the scientists at Pfizer were wonderful collaborators. You know, when people complain about you know, occult industry is and how difficult it is to collaborate with industry, that has not been my experience. I think that uh, we've gotten really terrific help out of industry scientists, particularly in this project. But so uh, this is uh, what happens. At, so we just thought of, like, what's the simplest experiment you could do to see if you're protecting bone marrow by taking the cells out of cycle? And so we thought, well, well, we'll give the animals a CDK4 inhibitor, and we know that makes some cells in the bone marrow not divide, and then we'll give them something that's very, very toxic to the bone marrow, and we thought the simplest thing was total body irradiation, and then we'll see if more or less mice die. And uh, so that's a so-called radio protection or radio mitigation experiment, depending on the timing of the radiation-related drug. And uh, so we tried it with the palpocyclib, and it worked really well, and we tried it with ribocyclib, and it worked really well. And here's data from, this, from two of those experiments. So uh, pharma one, I think, is one of these is palpocyclib and one of these is ribocyclib. I don't even remember. But they were both back in the old days when they were numbers. Uh, and uh, this is the LD90, so uh, lethal dose 90 of total body radiation, and 90% of the animals will die. And if you give a uh, CDK4 inhibitor about the same time in this experiment, so exactly contemporaneous with the radiation, uh, you know, you can sort of decrease the, the mortality significantly. And so this experiment which was quite easy to do and very, very reproducible, told us we were on to something. But then understanding exactly what this was doing and how it worked turned out to be very hard. So I probably had this data in like 2007. And we've been sort of working on this now for a decade. And the other thing to know about this is, uh, you know, radio protectants and radio mitigants are of great interest to the U.S. government for biodefense applications, you know, if a dirty bomb goes off or something. But there's virtually no commercial market for them. <laughs> but there's huge commercial market for protecting from chemotherapy-induced myelosuppression. So that's quickly what we started working on. Uh, so uh, here's a brief to introduce trilocyclib. As I, I showed it before, is this molecule that has a, you know, nanomolar potency against uh, CDK4 and 6. All of the inhibitors are CDK9 inhibitors, it turns out. Uh, palpocyclib and ribocyclib are as well when we study them. But they're not you know, very potent ones, so it's sort of 50-fold. And they have, you know, not much activity for seven. That's important because this is a, a kinase that's involved in every S phase. And then they, and, and not, hitting, not hitting two, I think, is actually very, we believe, very important for this indication. So if, if, if you inhibit CDK2 and DNA damage a cell, that's like agonistic. So that increases tumor kill, I mean, cell kill quite a bit. So it's undesirable. Um, I, I will say one subtlety that, that if you start looking at the marketing material that, you know, the, the, all the companies are trying to differentiate themselves from each other, they, they, they play kind of fast and loose with the IC50s. The thing about cyclins and CDK4s is you, you have to do IC50s in the context of some cyclin, right? So, so with CDK2, you can do it with A1, A2, E1, E2. And with CDK4, you can do it with D1, D2, or D3, right? So they'll, so they'll often pick whatever, you know, gives them the best result compared to their competitor and makes their drug looks the, the least or most specific. But I think these are fairly, uh, you know, objective measures that we independently determine. Um, so trilocyclic, you know, back to the sort of uh, Florida, Oregon thing. Florida here looks very different. As I said, it, it, has, a, it has a closed tricyclic structure. This particular version even has a fourth ring, uh, but most of the molecules in the series do not have this ring closed. And as I said, this part of the molecule looks very similar to ribocyclic and palpocyclic. It has, you know, sort of Lipinski drug-like rules. It is a very good inhibitor of RB phosphorylation in cells that are RB competent, but in an RB deficient cell, it does nothing, so they don't have any RB. Um, and so it will inhibit the proliferation of these cells really well, but not this cell. Uh, and then, then I, I should mention, you know, a little bit about hematopoiesis, since that's what we're interested in protecting. So uh, as probably most of you know, the hematopoietic stem cell lives at the top of the tree and gives rise to the multipotent progenitors that we call MPP, and they give rise to committed progenitors of the lymphoid and myeloid lineages, and they give rise after many proliferative events. This is not drawn to scale. It may be 20 divisions from here to here. 
to effector cells like red cells and granulocytes and macrophages. And CLP uh, gives rise to all the lymphoid cells. And uh, these cells, importantly, can be distinguished based on flow cytometric characteristics, which we're good at in my lab. And so we started treating animals with CDK4 inhibitors and looking at the proliferation of these various compartments. And so here's what that kind of data looks like. So you know, the cells are sorted based on their cell surface markers and these various characteristics. So we can start with HSC down here. HSC, and EDU is, an, is a marker of proliferation. It's like BRDU. And uh, as you can see, cells, when they go through S phase, incorporate EDU. So here's a good one to look at. So this is a no EDU. That's what an untreated cell looks like. It has a ton of uh, EDU incorporated in the DNA. And then that's greatly reduced by treating with a CDK4 inhibitor. See, lymphocytes are very sensitive, B cells and T cells. HSC don't divide very much at all, but the little bit they do divide is pretty much stopped by a CDK4 inhibitor. And this, is, uh, this turns out to be the cell we spent the most time working on, these so-called LSK cells, which is lineage negative, SCA positive, KIT positive, which is enriched for MPP. And uh, this is really the biomark, the, the in, in vivo PD assay we used to develop, you know, to test these 100 compounds we developed. We had a, you know, we had a, we needed an in vivo assay. And so we would inject the mice with these drugs and then look at the proliferation of these cells because they're really, relatively easy to get. And so, the, you know, that, these were, this was the assay that the drugs were sort of developed against. And importantly, by the way, if you radiate an animal a lethal dose and transplant nothing but this cell, they'll recover. You know, that, that this, this, this prevents the toxicity of acute. If, if you can only protect this cell, you can prevent the uh, acute toxicity of radiotherapy. So, um, you know, we, we showed that uh, these different compartments are uh, more or less sensitive to CDK4 inhibitors. So as I said, HSC and MPP are quite sensitive in LSK cells. T cells are very, very sensitive. But like erythroid and myeloid progenitors, the more they get differentiated down that path, the less sensitive they are, which is why these drugs, I think, are well tolerated. Because uh, they don't cause the anemia and myelosuppression right away that, um, uh, say, a drug like cytoxan does. Uh, and here's sort of the inhibitory dose of all of those against these various compartments. And then this is what EDU recovery looks like in HSC. So with a, a you know one of either size dose here, the animals, the cells will stop dividing for about 24 hours, and then they have this rebound where they kind of overdivide a, a compensatory response at about 36 hours to start to recover. And we've shown this is very reproducible and multiple different cell types. So this tells you that if, with a single dose, you know, the, the cells are going to start dividing again somewhere between 24 and 36 hours, and that's when the chemotherapy drug can't be there anymore, right? So if the platinum is still hanging around at 28 hours, you need to give more of the CDK4 inhibitor, otherwise the cells are going to, the, the bone marrow is all going to divide in the presence of DNA damaging agents. And uh, so this, you know, th it sounds kind of easy, right? You, you ought to just ought to, uh, you know, inhibit the cells from dividing and make sure the drug's gone. But it turns out to be much harder than you would think. And your radiation is a lot simpler than chemo drugs because a lot of these drugs have biologic half-lives that are different from their pharmacologic half-lives. And so figuring that out, it, it almost requires an agent-by-agent -agent determination. So taxol is different for platinum, uh, and pharmacology is in what guides these sorts of experiments. Uh, we showed it works with people. So we uh, gave trilocyclib to normal human uh, Dutch volunteers. Uh, don't ask me why they were Dutch. And, uh, and uh, did bone marrow biopsies. And, and that's uh, you know, something that's hard to do in the United States. But um, we showed pretty good inhibition of uh, total bone marrow proliferation, which is sort of a crude measure. You know, this is 90 to 95 uh, percent. But then we also looked at these sort of stem cell enriched fractions and showed a pretty good inhibition like we did in humans, I mean like we did in mice. And uh, just to remind people that hematologic toxicity chemotherapy is bad. So this is a study Mark Szynski did in a small cell lung cancer, uh, showing that this commonly regimen, used regimen of toposide platinum led to sort of delays in 38% uh, of patients and dose reduction in 27% of patients. And we know in small cell lung cancer, for example, dose intensity matters. The people who get less chemotherapy do less well. And the people who have delays in the chemotherapy do less well. So we think dose reductions are undesirable in this disease. Uh, and this is, by the way, the, uh, the first cancer we decided we wanted to try. And I think if you think about it for a while, you'll, you'll understand why. It's, 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 um, it is a, a regimen, it, it's, a, it's a cancer where the, the drug, the tumor is sensitive to chemotherapy, but the chemotherapy is very myelosuppressive, so that's a big problem. And uh, importantly, the tumor is RB null, and I'll come back to why that matters in a moment. So we showed uh, in mice again that, you know, by, protect, by making the bone marrow not divide at the time of chemotherapy administration, you could protect all the lineages of the, of the bone marrow. So we protect neutrophils, so here untreated mice, and here mice given 5-FU, and this also works for platinum uh, and cytoxan in mice. And, uh, and then if you give uh, a CDK4 inhibitor right at the same time as the 5-FU, you restore neutrophils, uh, lymphocytes to some degree, red cells, and uh, platelets. So quadrilineage protection 
with one dose of drug given at the same time as the DNA damaging agent. Uh, this is an assay that my postdoc discovered that's been used uh, to sort of, it was hearkened to the GCSF era as a way to measure protection of uh, granulocytic precursors. And we showed that um, what, the way it works is 5-FU is given to an animal every 10 days. And the animal can normally recover bone marrow counts two or three times, and by the third or fourth cycle, they, they, they have to be euthanized because of bone marrow failure. And so what we did was the same thing, but we just gave uh, a G1 drug at the same time as 5-FU. Uh, and you can see there's this remarkable prolongation of survival. So, you know, 28 days is what the vehicle-treated animals do with 5-FU, and we get it, you know, more than double that by giving a CDK4 inhibitor. And these animals, for the most part, are dying of granular cytopenia, which uh, surprised us a little bit, but that is, you can also get a pretty good lifespan extension of these animals with GCSF. And we showed that this is nothing parochial to the G1 drug that, uh, you know, uh, the palbociclib and ribociclib can do it as well. So here's the sort of relative survival benefit of various doses and schedules. GCSF also has a survival benefit. We couldn't measure it exactly because after multiple doses of human GCSF, the animals start to get like anaphylaxis to it. So we, we can only do this three or four times before, uh, you know, immune responses became limiting. But I think um, importantly, uh, you know, th th this is not a unique feature to one inhibitor or another. We think any sufficiently potent and selective CDK4 inhibitor will do this. We have tried some dirtier CDK4 inhibitors that also inhibit CDK2, and they don't do this very well. So they really have to be a selective molecule. Uh, and then we really got, and this is, this is sort of why I got into this in the first place. So I wanted to know if we could, you know, I, I think it's nice to be able to reduce the myelosuppression two weeks after chemotherapy, and that, you know, patients don't like blood transfusions and stuff like that. But I, I'm also very interested in the sort of the notion that cytotoxic chemotherapy sort of accelerates the aging of the bone marrow. I think the data for that are very strong. And patients who've survived, you know, six cycles of anthracyclines uh, are at much higher risk for leukemia and myelosplasia and bone marrow failure years later. We don't talk about this very much, and I think we minimize that toxicity tremendously in oncology. But it's a real thing. I, I think that we, um, uh, the, the bone marrow post uh, six cycles of DNA damaging agents is never quite the same. And we wondered if we could sort of ameliorate some of the toxicity of uh, that. And so this is how, this, this is a hard thing to do in humans. You know, these studies would take a very long time. So we, we decided to try it in mice. In mice, there's a, a really well-established model. I mean, it, it harkens to David Harrison in the 1970s of bone marrow exhaustion, where you can just give animals 5-FU every three weeks for uh, some time, and then eventually the HSC will stop losing their, will lose their ability to transplant. And so that's what we did. We treat animals with 5-FU, let them recover, treat animals with 5-FU again, let them recover, treat animals with 5-FU. And importantly, what, the, the wrinkle to our experiment, and then you transplant them into recipients that have been leukeal irradiated. And the, uh, the important part about this is that in this experiment, we also gave a CDK4 inhibitor with the 5-FU each time. And uh, so, uh, and looked at the ability to protect uh, stem cell function. And, and, and the reason this is a stem cell assay is because you let the cells engraft, and then you wait four to six months. And so every cell that's then present in the recipient, you know comes from the stem cell that was transplanted, right? So it's a, it's a true stem cell assay and not a progenitor assay like the prior result I showed. And here's what the da those data look like. It's a little bit complicated, but maybe I'll show the control is here. You know, you, can, you, you, you transplant uh, these cells in with competitor cells that are about one to one. So 50% of the cells come from the untreated animal if, in this experiment. And if the animals are given 5-FU, which is uh, in orange here, the ability to engraft is greatly decreased. Uh, and this is various lineages. So, you, you know, this is a, there's a big effect in the total bone marrow. There's an effect on the myeloid lineages, on the lymphocytes. Uh, in this system, we actually couldn't do platelets and, and B cells because the, the, the host, the, the 45 1.2 marker is not on this, those lineages. But in subsequent experiments, we have done those, and the results are the same. Uh, and, then, uh, and then if one uses a CDK4 inhibitor at the same time, there's some protection in the total bone marrow, and there's particularly good protection in the myeloid lineages, and to a lesser extent in the B and T cells. I think it's worth noting this is a log scale here, so these differences are significant, even though they don't look that great here. And then we also did the experiment of trying with Nulasta, which is GCSF, and I think probably most of you are aware Nulasta, we know it decreases the toxicity of chemotherapy acutely, but it is associated with a later risk of myelodysplasia and leukemia that we live with. You know, we say, you know, 2% increase in the risk of leukemia 10 years from now is worth being able to get your AC more in a dose-dense fashion for your breast cancer today. But uh, I, I don't think it's controversial. It's been reproduced in many large studies, and uh, we find it too, right? So if you use Nulasta to try and 
accelerate count recovery, that's really bad. So um, these stem cells work much less well, even than 5-FU treated animals alone. And importantly, we couldn't, that trumps the, the CDK4 inhibitor. So if we gave Nulasta and the CDK4 inhibitor, it was still bad. You know, those animals didn't do very well at all either. So we, we think Nulasta is pretty bad for stem cells. And if you think about why that is, it's, it makes them divide. It, it whips them. It forces them to go through proliferative events. It, it biases lineage choice that may be an unfavorable way. And uh, we think the thing that's bad for stem cells in this assay is the act of replication. So there, there's been a calculation in mice that hematopoietic stem cells may divide like four times the entire mouse lifespan. So if you make them divide two more times with the new Asta, that's probably bad for them, is the sort of mechanistic interpretation. So, uh, and then the other thing that happens to stem cells as you get old is they stop their ability, they lose their ability to make lymphocytes and start making uh, myeloid cells. So this is so-called myeloid bias. And these are animals that weren't transplanted. They were just given five of you a bunch of times with and without a CK4 inhibitor. And you can see if you measure just the peripheral blood, you know, six months after the last dose of five FU, the animals that are treated uh, have a lower lymphoid to myeloid ratio. So they start making myeloid cells in, in, at the expense of lymph lymphoid cells. So this is a well-known phenomenon that's been you know, demonstrated in many labs. And we could largely reverse that again with a CDK4 inhibitor. So we think we have two pieces of evidence that we're really protecting the HSC from an intrinsic aging, that they, they transplant better and they are less uh, myeloid biased. And so we think that will turn into uh, be beneficial in humans as well as the trilocyclic studies get going. So this phenomenon, I should say, is really robust. You know, as, as a mouse geneticist, it drives me crazy when someone publishes a result and then nobody can reproduce it and they say it was, you know, the strain or the sex or the age of the animal and stuff. So we did a lot of experiments to make sure none of those considerations applied. So it works in every strain we've tested. It works in rats, dogs, and humans. Uh, we tried some various knockout animals for reviewer-insisted experiments. We've done a lot of mice, you know, like over 1,000 now. We've done mice with cancer. We've done x-rays. We've done gamma rays. We've done platinum, 5-FU with topocyte adromycin. So it, it's a very robust finding that is generally reproducible in a multitude of lineages, uh, in a multitude of models. It's all four hematopoietic lineages as opposed to just GCSF working on one or erythropoietin working on red cells. And there's nothing magic about any CDK4 inhibitor. If it's suitably potent and selective, it will work, we think. Uh, but the, the problem in cancer, if you think about this for a second, is you know, that's great, you can protect the bone marrow, but if you put the tumor to sleep as well, you're going to protect the tumor, right? So you would not want to do this in a cancer where the trilocyclib or CDK4 inhibitor is going to inhibit the proliferation of the cancer. And so that means, you know, for the first time in my career, the, the actual details, the molecular details of the cell cycle within a tumor matter, right? So you wouldn't want to do uh, this pharmacological quiescence trick in all types of cancer because of the, uh, the effect of the CDK4 inhibitor on the cancer. So for example, uh, a mantle cell lymphoma, which is always cyclin D1 amplified, I would predict would be a bad idea because that's where CDK4 inhibitors have a little bit of single agent activity, as John Bird's work. And um, you know, if you inhibited uh, the proliferation of these cells and then gave the patient a bunch of adriamycin, that probably would be unfavorable. And uh, there are some trials now with palbocyclin and breast cancer going on trying to do something like this, but they, if you look at the details of the trial, they're, what they're really trying to do is synchronize. So they're trying to give the palbocyclin and then wait like 48 hours and then have the cytotoxic, you know, presumably all the cells will be going back in the S phase. But the, uh, the idea of giving co-administration of a cytotoxin and a CDK4 inhibitor, I believe, is, is like a, a, a terrible idea, although there are a few trials of that going on nationally. Uh, but a good one, if you think about it, would be small cell lung cancer because it's always RB null. So 100% of small cell lung cancer doesn't have RB. And, you know, we and others have shown that if a cell line or a mouse model doesn't have RB, it never responds to these molecules. So that's what we decided to do first, for, and also because it's a very, it's a, it's, a, it's a cancer where mild suppression is a big deal. So these are the trials now of trilocyclid that are open and rolling. These are all open in the United States, and uh, may, maybe even open here. I don't, I don't know if Emory has any of these trials, but they're open at about, we do? We do, we do. okay, yay. Uh, you know, they're open about uh, probably 40 sites, I think. And um, they are accruing uh, to varying degrees. I would say the, um, the problem with the small cell trials, first diagnosed small cell, you know, out of the box small cells, pretty hard trial to do in the United States because community oncologists like to treat that. So they're getting treated, uh, you know, at, at, at smaller centers and they're getting sent here when they relapse and have relapse refractory disease. So the second line trial that we had, which is uh, topotecan as a chemo backbone, fills much more quickly, but I think now uh, word's kind of gotten out and, 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 and accrual was picked up in both trials. And then the third trial I, I show here is, is the recently started triple negative breast cancer. And 
Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not clear how, what percentage of triple negative breast cancers are RB deficient. Certainly, about 30% of the tumors have RB mutations. But if you use sort of gene signature analysis, this is Chuck Peru discovery, he believes like sort of 100% of them have deregulated cell cycles. They have high levels of cyclin E and stuff that looks like, um, uh, you know, a, a deregulated RB pathway. And so we, the, the trial is in all, all triple negative patients because that's the clinically identifiable subpopulation. For better or for worse, they all kind of work the same way as the G1 drug and the chemo are given together. And then you wait 21 days and you do it over again. And most of them now are in the randomized portion. I think the, the breast cancer trial may still be in a dose finding portion, but the other ones are, are randomized at this stage. And the outcomes are you know, toxicity, febrile neutropenia, dose reductions, interruptions in dose, anti-tumor efficacy. The drugs, as I said, for first line, small cell are topocyplatinum. For second line, it's topotecan. Uh, you know, this is a little surprising. You know, the, the, the CDK4 inhibitor in this case is given five days in a row, as the topotecan is given five days in a row. We were sort of worried that would cause myelosuppression in and of itself, but it seems to be pretty well tolerated. We've been able to use sort of full doses of the drug with no problems. And then the trial that's just opened in, in triple negative breast cancer is a day one and day eight of a 21-day cycle with gemcitabine uh, carboplatin, and we can discuss why that regimen was chosen. Uh, it wasn't, I think, an obvious choice in retrospect. But um, so those are trials that are going on. I think uh, probably the first randomized data is not going to read out in 2018. It'll probably be early 2019, so it's going to be a while before we know but it won't be that long. Um, I will mention one last thing that I alluded to, which is, is you know, we, we, we started out to protect the bone marrow, but we are always interested in the idea that you could protect other proliferating cells. And, uh, and then, as I said, while, while we were working on that idea, uh, uh, a nephrologist at the Brigham at that time, and now he's chief of nephrology at WashU, uh, ben, Humphrey, ben Humphreys showed that cyclin D2 was absolutely required for the renal epithelia to proliferate. And so we, uh, with Ben, got, you know, tried injuring. So the, the way the kidney works is, is like totally quiescent. It doesn't divide at all. There's no BRDU uptake in a normal kidney. And then when the kidney's injured, all the epithelial cells go into cell cycle like that. So within 24 hours, you know, 50% of the cells will be taking up EDU. So it's a really remarkable proliferative system uh, that I, I think is a, a phenomenal. So, you know, as, as I mentioned, normally like nothing's dividing. So this is, I think, BRDU staining. And there's these cells, I can tell you, are not even renal epithelial cells. They're like things in the kidney that are not kidney epithelium. So it's like 0%. And then uh, in this case, the renal injury is ischemia. And 24 hours later, you know, like half the cells are dividing. And you can completely abrogate that with an even very low dose of a CDK4 inhibitor. And so uh, this is why platinum is damaging the kidneys, because the platinum accumulates in the kidney. It causes a little bit of damage. The kidney starts to proliferate. And then it's really damaging, right? As, as cells enter S phase, uh, platinum is quite toxic, and that, that's the mechanism of this sort of vicious cycle of platinum-based nephrotoxicity. So that was the other reason we wanted to do small cell, because we, that's a disease where platinum-induced nephrotoxicity still occur, occasionally occurs, particularly with cisplatin. And the trials are in no way po powered to see a difference in nephrotoxicity, but that's an endpoint that we're looking at as well to see if we reduce the uh, incidence of kidney damage from, uh, from platinum in, in small cell. So uh, in summary, the cell cycle in selected cells can be modulated without toxicity. 4-6 inhibitors are promising antineoplastics in a combination with other agents. Uh, pharmacological quiescence requires a very potent and selective 4-6 inhibitor, and pharmacological quiescence provides, at least in animal models, radio mitigation, uh, chemo protection, and renal protection. And uh, here are the people who did the work. I, I think, you know, these are people in my lab and other investigators at UNC. Uh, Kwok Wong, who I, I showed his picture here, is a co-founder of the company and has been an inspiration in a lot of this work. These are the guys who did the kidney stuff when they were at Harvard. As I said, Ben is now at WashU. And then these are scientists who at one time were in my lab and now have all migrated to the company uh, where, uh, you know, they're happy, it seems. So I'd be happy to take any questions.